Welcome to the fourth meeting of Criminal Law. Our subject is the definition of criminal offenses. Criminal offenses are defined in terms of sets of elements. The Model Penal Code suggests that we analyze the language we find in statutes into three different types of element. This is not always necessary to do. The facts of particular cases will determine whether this exercise has a point or not. Let's look at what these three types of element are. Elements of an offense mean such conduct, or such attendant circumstances, or such a result of conduct as must be con established to convict. Conduct, attendant circumstances, result. We can use this classification to distinguish the offense of reckless driving from an offense of, call it, vehicular homicide. The difference is that to convict someone of vehicular homicide, the prosecution must show that a person died. Reckless driving can also be charged, but the prosecution need not show that anyone died as a result. In fact, nobody even need have been hurt. Not all offenses have a result element or attendant circumstance elements, but every criminal offense must include a conduct element. Recall that conduct means an action or a series of acts, and that a person is not guilty of an offense unless his liability is based on conduct, which includes a voluntary act. Occasionally, it is crucial to decide whether an element is a conduct element or an attendant circumstance element. Recall the Martin case. The statute in Martin contained two verbs, appears and manifests. Manifests is clearly a conduct element. The court in Martin focused instead on appears and assumed it was also a conduct element, which had to include a voluntary act. Is this the interpretation the legislature intended? Or did it mean the term appears to be read as stating an attendant circumstance? An attendant circumstance element need not include a voluntary act. The phrase where one or more persons are present is another attendant circumstance. It would be silly for Martin to defend by saying those persons hadn't been put there by his effort. Martin would similarly be without a defense if appears had been read as stating an attendant circumstance. Let's go back to the legislative drawing board. Think of how the legislature might have made it clear that appears in a public place does not presuppose a voluntary act. Cutting out the verb appears makes it clearer that in a public place is an attendant circumstance element rather than a conduct element. Any person who, while intoxicated or drunk in any public place where one or more persons are present, manifests a drunken condition, by boisterous or indecent conduct or loud or profane discourse shall on conviction be confined. Liability would still be based on conduct, including a voluntary act, namely manifesting drunkenness by boisterous or indecent conduct or loud and profane discourse. We will want to be on the lookout for verbs, action words, as the words supplying the conduct element. Because the word appears did appear in the statute, the court in Martin assumed that it was a separate conduct element rather than an attendant circumstance element. Alternatively, the legislature might have used the phrase one who is found rather than the phrase one who appears, the passive voice. 
Now, suppose the legislature wanted to state more clearly that it does mean to require the prosecution to prove a defendant's voluntary presence in a public place where others were present. How might it do that? The legislative draft person could have used different words. Instead of appears, one who makes or puts in an appearance in any public place. The choice of words matters. As students of the law, we have to learn to choose carefully.